All right, we're back uh, with this puzzler of why do S and Esh look slightly different, um, but also slightly the same in spectrogram view. Uh, so again, S and Esh have a lot of intensity at these high frequencies, but the cutoff between sort of high intensity energy or high intensity frequencies and low intensity frequencies for S is much higher on the frequency scale than what we see for Esh. The reason why is because the filters are different for those two fricatives. So they have similar sound sources in that uh, you're producing a lot of obstacle turbulence at the back of the teeth. Uh, they both have are directing airflow at the back of the teeth, so they are obstacle fricatives. However, um, the filter is going to be slightly different in front of them. So for Esh, it's a little bit further back in the vocal tract. You get a slightly longer tube. That's going to resonate at slightly lower frequencies. Um, and on top of that, um, you get what is called a sublingual cavity. Uh, shh, because there's a little bit of space underneath the tip of your tongue <clears throat> when your tongue is a bit further back. Shh. Uh, when you're producing an S, and that will resonate as well, along with the length of the tube uh, to begin with. Um, in English, the acoustic distinction between S and Esh is also what they call enhanced through lip rounding for Esh. Uh, so you can say S and Esh without rounding your lips for either one. And you can hear the difference between them. Uh, but typically, when people say esh, or at least emphasize it in English, <clears throat> they'll round their lips to a certain extent and kind of protrude them as well. Shh, 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 right? Uh, so that's going to extend that little vocal tract filter a little bit for esh, uh, and also lower the resonant frequencies of esh a little bit and make them more distinct. This is kind of like another example of um, adaptive dispersion theory in play, uh, trying to make these two fricatives sound more distinct from each other to make them, I guess, easier to perceive um, or easier to perceive the distinction between them. Uh, here's <clears throat> kind of a mid-sagittal view of uh, that sublingual cavity I was talking about, that little um, kind of gap between the bottom of the tongue and the bottom of your mouth, which you don't really get an S because your tongue is too far forward to really create much of a gap there. Um, so that should give you uh, more resonance there as well. Or uh, a longer resonating tube, which would lead to lower frequencies um, resonating in the S as opposed to the S. Uh, so we can check this out. We'll look at the um, we'll look at the uh, lip rounding part of this first. So I'm going to turn off the sound of um, and make of the computer and make sure I have the right clips here. So I've got these one word video clips uh, that were used for a uh, audiovisual speech perception study uh, in the place where I worked as a postdoc many years ago. Um, so these are just one word uh, and they're consonant vowel consonant words. Uh, so I'm just going to play them without the sound on. Uh, and this is a little uh, demo. Most people um, feel like they're not very good at reading lips, but most people actually have some um, inherent ability to uh, pick up um, some sound cues from just visual uh, information alone. You can we can see how well you guys do with this set of videos. I'll make this full screen to give you a better shot at it. Uh, so I'm going to play this without sound. You can try to guess uh, what word you think the speaker is saying. I'm going to play it one more time. Okay, turn the sound on. We'll give this a shot. Shot. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too hard because we've got two cues with the lips here. She rounds her lips a little bit for that shh at the beginning of shop. Stop. And then also closes her lips for the puh there. And in the middle, I got a nice low back vowel ah. Um, that one's not too hard. We'll turn the sound off. Let's see how you guys do with this one. Okay, play it silently first. And I'll do it one more time. Okay, maybe not as many cues going on there. We'll play it with sound on, see how you did. South. Okay, so it starts out with an S right there. She's not rounding her lips for that at all. Uh, got a little bit ow, and then you can see if we do this very slowly, she um, makes an interdental fricative and so puts the tip of her tongue underneath her upper row of teeth there, but that's still hard to see. South. So that one's not as easy as shop, but maybe you got it anyways. I'll play a couple more just for kicks. I'll turn the sound off here. You can tell me what you see in this one.
Okay, and play it with the sound on. Wash. All right, so I wanted to play this one because it shows you there's kind of two different types of lip rounding you can get. Uh, so this begins with a wa, uh, which is a nice rounded glide. Yeah. And she kind of is really hyper articulating here to make these uh, distinctions clear. And sorry, that's a bit of a funny frame to pause on, but that's how tightly she's rounding your lips for the wa. Um, and then if we move to the shh, she's still rounding your lips a little bit there, but not nearly to the same extent as for the wa, right? Um, so a little bit of protrusion, a little bit of rounding. We'll do one more, E2. The E means these are all supposed to be easy. Uh, thankfully, I'm not playing any hard ones for you, but we'll see how easy this one is for you. Okay, now with the sound on, how did you do? Wife. Okay, so this one has a what? again at the beginning, and then maybe a little bit of a visual cue for the fa there at the end. So wife. Wife. So maybe F helps you out visually a little bit too, um, perhaps to distinguish it from say the theta, uh, which, to which it sounds pretty similar. Um, okay, so uh, I can also give you a couple of videos about what happens behind the constriction for S and S, because that's also different. Um, so interestingly for S, you tend to um, kind of push down the center of your tongue uh, and make a little bit of a groove here, uh, which helps sort of direct the flow of air straight up at the teeth to make it even louder than it would be otherwise. So air follows through this channel. Uh, these lighter lines are supposed to represent the sides of the tongue uh, and then gets kind of shot up through this narrow constriction at the teeth here. For shh, you actually raise the center of your tongue and it has to kind of, the airflow has to kind of go over that arch uh, through that narrow channel, maybe doesn't hit the um, teeth quite as uh, harshly as it would for an S. You can try this um, just by yourself. I'll show you what it looks like in an ultrasound view here in a second. Uh, but you can try just saying S and S and going back and forth between one and the other. Uh, and maybe you can feel what you're doing uh, with the center of your tongue. So, maybe you can feel the center of your tongue rising up for the S. Maybe you don't. Some people report to me they do it kind of the opposite of what's expected. Judge for yourself. Uh, I'll give you these um, ultrasound videos. Uh, this is the word safe. Safe. I'll turn that up a little bit. Safe. Uh, so we'll pause it at the S right about here. And you can see he raises the tip of his tongue here and he's lowering the center of his tongue, kind of arching the um, back portion of the tongue a little bit. I don't know if I'd quite say this is a velarized S, but it's sort of like that. Um, Safe. Uh, we can contrast that with shake. Shit. No, I'll, I'll just play through it once. Shake. And then pause it on the sh. Sh. Yeah, so the center of his tongue is arched here. Uh, and the tip of the tongue, the tongue doesn't come up quite as much uh, because he's making trying to make a constriction more in this region uh, than he was for um, the S. You can also see he's rounding his lips a little bit too um, to make that shh. Okay, technical term for that grooving of the tongue here is that it's sulcalized, S-U-L-C-A-L-I-Z-E. -E. Uh, we don't need to worry about that too much, but um, just so you know, um, I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, so <coughs> these are a couple of colleagues uh, that I worked with at Indiana. Um, they're very happy to be phoneticians. Uh, and I've got recordings of them saying the word speech. Uh, so this is Susie Levy, who works at NYU now. Speech. Saying speech. Speech. And then this is David Pizzoni, who, as far as I know, still works at Indiana University, uh, saying speech. Speech. Uh, so you might notice that if you listen closely, um, that uh, there's a P right after this S. Uh, so there's a possibility that um, because of the anticipation of the production of the P here, this S might get rounded a little bit, uh, which is what David does. Susie doesn't speech round it. Speech. David does. So this is another trick you can do. You can just say an S and round and unround your lips as you go to kind of get a sense of the acoustic effects of uh, rounding on the fricative. Uh, and you can hear when you round that, uh, that the um, 
intense frequencies uh, go down in, or the intense energy goes down in frequency uh, because you're getting more of a, a, a longer resonating filter for that particular fricative. You can do it for the ash as well, rounding and unrounding your lips because um, we typically round them, but you can unround them if you want. And then if you're not rounding uh, an ash, it's going to sound a lot more like an S. If you round an S, it's going to sound a lot more like an ash. Uh, and this just happens naturally uh, in casual speech in contexts like this. Um, there's also an interesting phenomenon uh, kind of going in um, that's been going on in modern English for at least the last 20 years, which is when uh, I was first made aware of it. Uh, so it was, let's see, uh, 18 years ago uh, in the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl, the Tom Brady one, um, New England versus... Um, the Rams back in the day. Uh, so you two played the halftime show uh, and somebody, I was in grad school at the time and somebody pointed out that they played the song where the streets have no name, but uh, Bono was saying where the streets have no name. Uh, so there was a bit of this um, sort of palatalization of the S there. So er is a post alveolar sound and you tend to round your lips for the er as well. And if you anticipate that you can sort of have uh, regressive assimilation back to the S. So S, if it's produced in a more post alveolar and lip rounded way, uh, will sound more like a street. Streets have a no name. Uh, and it was pointed out to me that that uh, on the original recording of that song, which is back in 87, um, way back now, on the Joshua Tree, uh, Bono did not do that. He said, where the streets have no name. However, uh, people can go back and forth with this. So I've got this clip here from um, show 30 rock which is now probably about 12 or so years old um and now kind of in the dustbin of tv history even though it was kind of funny so this is tina fey and i'll just let you listen to this one as she goes through how was your evening with thomas you mean gretchen thomas the brilliant plastics engineer slash lesbian what made you think i was gay your shoes. Well, I'm straight. Those shoes are definitely bi-curious. Regardless, I am straight. 100% completely straight. Okay, uh, you guys are phoneticians, so I bet you picked up on that. But she says the word straight three times. Uh, and the first time she says straight. Sh sorry, straight. Second time she says straight. Third time she says straight again. So she's going back and forth between them, but it's same context, same sort of um, assimilatory phenomenon slash lesbian what made you think i was gay your shoes well i'm straight those shoes are definitely bi-curious regardless i am straight 100 percent completely straight all right so uh yeah you can watch out for that um i haven't heard it in canada as much as i have heard it in the u.s but it still exists up here uh, if you keep your ears open, you might pick up on it somewhere. I'll point out as well something that's kind of interesting. Um, S is a consonant which can kind of attach itself to the beginning of a lot of different types of onset clusters in English. Uh, but you never find it um, in a word initial SR sequence. So we don't get words like shriek in English, uh, but we do get words like shriek. Uh, so it kind of prefers, if you're going to put a sibilant fricative in this context, um, English prefers to have one that's post alveolar, like the um, er right after it. Uh, okay, um, yeah, so lip rounding can be used to enhance other fricative contrasts. Uh, so in Polish, it can enhance the contrast between uh, retroflex and dental fricatives. Uh, if you know any Polish speakers, you might be able to see this, but uh, similar to the way it works in English, the retroflex fricatives get the rounding. Um, so I'll play some examples. Polish is chock full of fricatives, which makes it a fun language. Um, and uh, we'll just listen to it first, just this contrast, and then we'll add another one to it. Sali. Shali. Shali. Zalef. Zalef. Żali. 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 Kasa. Kasza. Skaza, gaza. Okay, so uh, Polish has just kind of a regular alveolar fricative, kasa, or dental fricative, kasha, and a retroflex fricative. Uh, in addition to that, Polish has what is known as alveolopalatal fricatives, which are basically <clears throat> um, palatalized 
alveolar fricatives. Uh, so slightly different from a post alveolar fricative, um, but uh, they're constricted in say the post alveolar region and then also have a raised tongue in the palatal region. Um, other languages do this with the first constriction primarily in the alveolar region. Uh, so the way this is transcribed uh, is that uh, the voiceless version is a C with this little curly Q on the right hand side and the voiced version is a Z symbol with a curly Q on the right hand side as well. Uh, so usually English speakers have no problem distinguishing these first two columns from each other but these second two might be a little trickier so what these are going to sound like uh, because you're making kind of a palatal constriction as you make the fricative is that they're kind of be like going to be like a sh with a yod off glide or maybe a sub with a yod off glide shali 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 yep zale jali jali yeah Kasa, kasha, kashash. And I think you can kind of hear that yod off glide when he produces this one. Kashash, skaza, gaja, kaja. Yeah. So that's fun. We'll look at these um, in terms of their acoustic properties. So this is the retroflex fricative. Shali. All of these. Um, look like sibilants because they have a lot of intensity up here at the higher end of the frequency range. Uh, the alveolo palatal one uh, is going to be higher in the frequency range um, in terms of its uh, cutoff point between high intensity and low intensity energy uh, than is the retroflex one. The retroflex one again usually has a little bit of lip rounding on top of it to kind of extend that filter and give you that kind of lower cutoff point. Um, I'm going to mention here as well that where we see tend to see a lot of intensity for retroflex things um, is around this 2000 hertz region. There tends to be uh, retroflexes tend to be distinguished with a low F3. Um, so you can kind of see that here. This is F1, F2, and this is F3 kind of pointing down into this fricative. Charlie. But that um, articulation tends to just lower F3, so we get kind of a dark bar for that fricative here. Uh, and what we tend to see for the shali, shali, if I produce that anywhere close to the way a Polish speaker would, uh, is that you kind of get kind of a yod looking off glide after the fricative. And what that looks like is it starts off sort of like an E with a low F1, high F2 before it gets into the regular formant frequencies we'd expect to see out of an ah. Shali. Um, yeah. So might be hard to hear, but that's what you can look for in the spectrogram to kind of pick up on what's going on with those two. Uh, I'll mention here as well that uh, way back in the day when I taught this class at Illinois, um, there was a speaker in the class who had grown up in Chicago, but I didn't realize this at the time, um, but apparently there are still Polish speaking neighborhoods in Chicago. So he had grown up bilingually as a native speaker of both Polish and English. Uh, and so at the end of the semester, we did a palatography demo uh, with him as our speaker, and he produced some of these fricatives that we're talking about. Uh, this didn't turn out to be the greatest picture ever, but it's uh, his production of the fricative uh, that's supposed to be in this form. Uh, so for him, it's mostly kind of an alveolar, because this is, uh, again, that um, method where you paint uh, uh, black gunk on a speaker's tongue. The black gunk is it's pretty straightforward. It's just charcoal dust and olive oil. Uh, so you mix it together, and then I... We do this demo in 441 every year. It's kind of fun. You apply it with a uh, Q-tip. Make sure <laughs> things don't get messy with like a handkerchief or a towel on the speaker's shirt. Uh, and then ask them to say something like uh, casa. Uh, and the black stuff will get uh, left on the palette of the speaker. Um, and you can take a picture of it using a mirror uh, and to find out where the contact was made. Uh, so these are a little chalky kind of palatograms. This is where we get uh, contact for Kasha. that retroflex fricative kind of on the sides in this post alveolar region. And then also Kaja. Kaja, where you have kind of longer contact on the side from front to back because you're raising the arch of the tongue uh, sort of in the center of the mouth. So there's uh, broader contact from front to back there than just kind of the edges or the sides of the tongue here for the retroflex. Okay, so there's lots of different ways you can kind of try to piece out or um, figure out where what sort of distinctions are being made between these two fricatives, even if you can't hear it that well. There's acoustic uh, approaches, there's articulatory approaches to um, kind of pinning it down. Um, Polish, I'll mention, is just a fun language in general because uh, it has lots of consonant clusters. 
Uh, so I'll just walk you through this slide just for kicks. Uh, these are lots of fun um, Polish uh, words that we can try to say together. Uh, I'm not going to put these on the next production exercise, but um, don't tempt me. Uh, I'm just kidding. Here we go. Uh, is the word rainy in uh, Polish? Wczysty. Multiple. Mnogi. One. Chcieć. Bark. Szczekać. I'll just let him talk. Bzdura. Płciowy. Szczwany. Lśnić. Pstrzyć. Wzdłuż. Wskrześ. All right, no problem, right? Um, I'll focus for a little bit on this one because it has four different fricatives in it and one stop and one lonely vowel, uh, but it's no problem, right? Wskrześ. Yeah, so here it is again. Wskrześ. We're getting close to Easter time is the word for resurrect in Polish. Uh, so here's our F. Oh, it's not going to play for me. Uh, so this is the F. Part of it, again, it's diffuse, and it has, actually, maybe I can do it this way. Uh, yeah, so it's diffuse. Uh, it has um, low amounts of energy across the board, but it's all kind of evenly distributed. Here's the S. Uh, with the F, we get, or with the S, we get uh, more intensity up here. Remember, I'm cutting this off at 5,000 hertz, so you don't see all of the intensity that S would produce up here. For the retroflex S, you kind of lower, wind up lowering the frequencies a bit. Uh, so you see that dark band come down there. Uh, and this is the alveolo palatal one. Um, this one you can kind of see, it kind of helps to look at what the formants of the vowel are doing because they're pointing towards like an E-like pattern at the end with low F1, high F2. That means you're moving your tongue into the position where you normally have it for an E, uh, which is like a palatalization of the vowel and or consonant. Um, I'll give you a couple more examples. Uh, Mandarin also has dental, post-alveolar, and alveolopalatal sibilant fricatives. They sound a little bit different than the ones in, um, in um, Polish, though the post-alveolars are sometimes retroflex, uh, which is uh, transcribed here with an S with a dot underneath it. That's um, uh, kind of a transcription system, which is commonly used for um, South Asian languages, but I won't get into that too much. Um, so this is uh, the Mandarin versions of the dental. Sa and the post-alveolar and the alveolopalatal. Xia, sa, sha, xia. And I think with this one, you can kind of clearly hear that you kind of yawed off glide to the fricative. Xia. Uh, so here's just a set of Mandarin fricatives. Uh, they also have labial dental and velar fricatives. Fa, sa, sha, xia, ha. Uh, and that gives you a nice kind of sample of the velar one too, right? Uh, according to legend, um, Mandarin is supposed to have uh, syllabic retroflex fricatives. Uh, when you actually listen to this, um, the way these are pronounced is more like just a syllabic R type articulation, but I'll let you be the judge. Yeah, uh, but it doesn't seem to be much of a vowel in there as we normally think of it. Um, I'll give you another uh, example of some interesting sibilants. So Shona is spoken in Zimbabwe and has what are called whistling fricatives. This is not something I'm very good at producing on demand, so I'm just going to let the speaker do it. But um, I think you get there uh, by producing retroflex fricatives with lip rounding, uh, and then it winds up sounding like a, a whistle because the resonance just kind of matches up uh, really well to kind of pick out a per really particular frequency um, to resonate at. Uh, so here's some contrasts uh, between just regular alveolar fricatives. Sika. Oops, not super loud, but hopefully you can hear that. So um, regular alveolar, and then also um, these rounded out retroflexes. Sika. Sika. I think they added a little bit of reverb there to help kind of accentuate that effect, but. Zizi. Zizi. Kusora. Kusora. Kuzara. Kuzara. It's still kind of cool to hear. Shika. Zizi. Kusora. Kuzara. Yeah. Um, I noticed this in another context as well. Uh, way back when, this is, these are some samples from the um, 
2008 presidential election uh, in the US. So uh, where I hear this is with older speakers, perhaps because they're wearing dentures, uh, it can be hard to produce some of these uh, fricatives the way uh, you ideally want to if you're wearing um, sort of artificial teeth. Uh, they don't sort of get in the same position as uh, your natural teeth might. Um, so I'll play a contrast between a Barack Obama. You talk about the surge, the, the war started in 2003. So he's saying this word started, start, oops, started. And I'm going to play, I'll just have to go to this, but I'm going to play a contrast with jo John McCain. So that's a nice S. Uh, here's John McCain. Senator Obama refuses to acknowledge. So uh, let's do it one more time. You can hear the senator and the refuses. Senator Obama refuses to acknowledge. Uh, he's got a link, bit of a whistling effect there. Senator Obama. Like that. Right. Um, so here's kind of the acoustic effect here that you get um, between the two. Uh, this is what a regular S looks like on the left hand side here. Um, and then this is what this sort of whistling fricative looks like over here. Oh, there's dinner. Uh, what the whistling fricative looks like here over on the right. Um, and uh, I've got uh, some examples of uh, Keith Olbermann producing what sounds like a pharyngeal fricative as well. I'll play these for you and then uh, take a little break. And yet to me, this vote is horrible. Horrible. Right. Uh, we'll do that one more time. And yet to me, this vote is horrible. Horrible. <laughs> that sound. Uh, voice is pharyngeal fricative. So you can target that when you do your production exercise. Uh, like I said, I'm going to have to take a little bit of a break, uh, but I'll just wrap up the last few slides here uh, in a minute.